has come before God joyfully. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh God. Hallelujah. Sing beautiful Savior. Even though the sun just goes to rise and begin to adore and worship God. 
Welcome back to Tabernacle of Praise. Today, even as we come, this is the first Sunday of the month, and as usual, we'll be having the Holy Communion. If uh, you have not received your emblems, can you please make sure that you have taken one from outside? Okay, or you need help, you just raise your hands and the ushers will assist you. Okay, if everyone has the cup ready, yeah, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending us your Son. Lord, we thank you that out of your great love for us, you have given us the very best gift ever, which is the gift of salvation. That we can come to know you, that we can come into your presence, that we can call you ever, Father. So today, as we partake of the Holy Communion, be with us, help us to re remember all that you have done for us on the cross. That we together are one loaf. We together are your body. And so Lord, bless the emblems before us as we partake of this Holy Communion. That you will always remember what, we will always remember what you have done for us. And that Lord, we will look forward to your second coming as well. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the cup together. Lord, we thank you for this moment that this Holy Communion is so special to us because today we are gathered here physically in the presence of one another and in your presence. Lord, we thank you that you have taken us so successfully through the pandemic that Lord, you have preserved our health and today as we come, Lord, we want to thank you for all that you have done for us we also want to thank you for each other, for our brothers and our sisters, those that we can see around us. We want to appreciate them and we want to remember, Lord, all these good things that we have in our lives, they come from you. So be with us as we continue with the service. Be with us, O oh God, and rule and reign. And may you be exalted, may you be magnified, may you be God of all as we we look to your word and Lord, let your word, O oh God, just speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We have a number of uh, announcements uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, worship team. You know, today we have the One Family Plus Albert to lead us in uh, worship. And it's so wonderful to see the whole family serving God together. And uh, welcome back to church. After a long, long break, 
I think all of us look at each other like someone says, um, maybe cannot even recognize some of them. But I do know one thing, all the youth, they have shot up. You know, when I, the, I think the last time I saw them, uh, they, they weren't so tall. And today, uh, or even yesterday when I met one, and today, you know, they have suddenly shot up and become so tall. But for most of us, uh, we didn't grow taller. What we have, has happened is we have grown broader, okay? <laughs> okay? So whatever it is, praise the Lord, uh, God has been so good and we are back. Now, now that we are back, we are going to get into gear to serve the Lord. So the first announcement is concerning help. We need help, alright? Uh, if you look at the worship ministry, uh, they also need help. They need help with uh, worship leaders, they need help with backups, they need help with musicians, alright? So if you are interested and you have the skill sets that is required, please do contact Brother Alvin or even Brother Terence uh, and uh, arrange for some audition and we'll see how we can incorporate you into the worship ministry. Another ministry that is in dire straits that need a lot of help would be the multimedia ministry. If you look back now, uh, Alex is hiding his head, uh, but there's only one person manning both the sound and also the LCD projector. So he needs help. And moreover, with two services, he was here yesterday and he's here again. So if you are, are quite a technical person, and you have a good ear for sound or whatever, please do contact uh, Sister Yilin or Alex, all right? And uh, they will give you some training and then you will be able to uh, manage that. And last but certainly not least will be our children's church. Our children's church needs a lot of uh, fresh blood. Now, I'm not saying that the, the existing teachers are no good or whatever. Huh? It's just that now, uh, children below the age of 12, they are not allowed to come, not to say not allowed, uh, they are discouraged from coming to church. So, children's church is held via Zoom. When that happens, you need people who are quite tech savvy. And so, we need a fresh, uh, uh, fresh infusion of fresh blood who will be able to handle that. And uh, we encourage you, especially if you are young parents, now that your children are in children's church, why don't you serve as well? You serve so that you know what your children are learning. You can reinforce the, for the rest of the week. Okay, so those are the, our urgent needs. Actually, there are other needs. But these three are the urgent needs. So do respond, okay? Next, we have a little party coming up. And that's the children's church Christmas come birthday blast is going to be held on uh, 19th of december okay and the time is from 4 to 5 30 pm and it'll be via zoom everything is zoom we are all getting to be very good zoomsters all right so via zoom uh, there'll be a christmas story there'll be presents there'll be food all right not virtual food actual food so uh, we do invite you to invite your friends uh, those who qualify as children's church are not adults uh, to join in and the last time we had a party we had 21 children via zoom and a few of them are now faithfully attending children's church so you never know through this event god can bring in more children to our church okay so do respond with that and register by 10th of december and uh, we are going to have a very important meeting soon. Uh, in two weeks' time, we are going to have our 38th AGM. It will be on Sunday, 19th of December, held at 11 a.m. And because it's held at 11 a.m., we have to push up the English service. So on that Sunday, English service will be at 9.30. Okay, 9.30. Uh, I encourage all of you, if you, are, you know you are a member, to check your names, whether uh, you are on the voting list, and also to collect your uh, AGM reports if you want a physical copy. I think Pastor Esther has already sent out all the soft copies to you. So if 
uh, for those of us who need something we can tangible that we can touch, you can collect a copy from outside. Okay. And the last one is welcome back to church. We are having our on-site worship services and it's so good to see all your faces. Uh, people are slowly coming back uh, because uh, of the sentiment that's going on. But praise the Lord, you are here. You are here and we also welcome those who are watching on broadcast. We have not missed you, okay? You are still part of us. Okay, now moving to the message today. I want to ask you whether there have been times when you are eating at a coffee shop and suddenly everybody disappears. And then it's because the Kopitiam uncle has said, Ma ta lai liao lo! Ma ta lai liao lo! You know why they are disappearing? Because they have parked their cars illegally. So when you park your car illegally, when the police come, the enforcement officers come, what do you do? You abandon your breakfast no matter how good the curry mee or the, the hair mee is. Uh, you abandon it and you rush and you remove your cars. And this arrival of the enforcement officers, this coming has changed your priorities. No longer breakfast. Make sure I don't get a fine. All right? And it compelled necessary actions. Or in another scenario, it could be that you have been left at home, maybe you are a, a, a teenager, and your mummy says, uh, you make sure you bring in the clothes, okay? Uh, and you clear up your room. Uh, Daddy and I will be going out to do some shopping. We'll be back soon. So you know, once mummy and daddy go out for errands, uh, they will take easily two hours. So what do you do now? Okay, go and play some video games, uh, watch some TV, uh, do whatever things, call your friends and all that. Suddenly, half an hour later, your mom calls and says, Ah, we finished our errands already, we are on our way back. What do you do? Oh, mommy, daddy coming back. You immediately, uh, zoom, clear your room, bring in the clothes and make sure everything is ready. And so, now we are in this season of coming as well. We are waiting for the coming of Christmas, right? And in the old days, this season is called the season of Advent. Advent is from a Latin word that means visit or coming. The Lord is coming. And Christmas has a sense of anticipation. The minute you see a Christmas tree a bit smaller this year, uh, never mind, uh, I'm so used to our church having big Christmas trees. There's a sense of expectancy and it will feel more Christmassy when you hear Christmas carols. That's why thank you, Brother Jacob, for singing um, Christmas carols for us. Because when you hear Christmas carols, you know, hey, Christmas is coming. There is uh, something beautiful about Christmas. And one of my favorite uh, Christmas carols is Isaac Watts' Joy to the World. Okay, and if you uh, look at the lyrics, now sometimes we sing songs and we don't care about the lyrics, we just sing. But if you are careful, you read the lyrics, you will find that the lyrics talk about the coming of Jesus, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Then the second stanza says what? Joy to the world, the Saviour reigns. It is talking about the first advent when Jesus came as a baby, and then the second advent, when Jesus is coming as a reigning king. And if you look at many of the hymns for Christmas, you will find a, an emphasis both on the first advent and the second advent. But gradually the church begin to, began to uh, leave out the second advent and focus just on the first advent, which is the coming of Jesus uh, at Christmas. All right? Christmas. Now, why? That's because, uh, and the church has always uh, designed Christmas to celebrate both the first and the second advent for two reasons. First, the reason, uh, Alex, could we have the slide now, the first one? The first reason is because in the Old Testament, there are two main promises. The first promise is that the Messiah would come 
And the Messiah would come and save his people from all their sins and deliver them from all their enemies. So that was accomplished when Jesus came the first time. Now there is also a second promise and this second promise is that the Messiah would not only defeat his enemies, which is already done, but he would destroy them and deliver his people into a glorious forever kingdom. And this is what we are expecting in the second advent. Now this morning, we just celebrated a very meaningful Lord's Supper. Why is it so meaningful today? It is meaningful today because I can see you face to face. And it is meaningful because I know I am in the midst of God's people. So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we also have a tendency to uh, just recall that the Lord's Supper is always done in remembrance of Jesus. And it's very correct. It is always done in remembrance of what Jesus has done on the cross. That Jesus came, he died, he rose again and saved us. But if you look at the verses that we read this morning, you will notice that verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, till he comes so when we take the holy communion there's also that forward-looking aspect where we are longing for jesus to come again and we are very special people because we are people living in between two advents we are living in between the first advent where jesus came as a baby and the second advent when jesus is coming as a reigning king and so, the title of this sermon is called Living in the In-Between. So, we are the in-betweeners, all right? The people living in the in-between. And uh, to uh, flesh out this uh, message, we are going to look at the book of Revelation. Uh, turn to chapter 1 and we'll begin with verse 4. Verse 4, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who saves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Then John continues, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So in his salutation, John immediately tells us that it is the triune God. It is God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit who and has caused this salvation to come to us. And he says, him who is and who was and who is to come refers to God the Father, our eternal God. Then it talks about the seven spirits. Now it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is, there are seven Holy Spirits, all right? The number seven refers to completeness. So it means that the Holy Spirit in all his completeness is there involved in our salvation. And then it ends with Jesus Christ as the prophet, priest and king. But it is only to Jesus that the book of Revelation is uh, dedicated. Actually, the author is Jesus Christ, the focus is Jesus Christ, and the book is dedicated to Jesus Christ as well. And the reason is given in uh, the following verse where it says, To him who loves us, and this refers to the first coming, Jesus loves us, all right? To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So all these are accomplished. 
at the first advent where Jesus came, he lived, he died and he rose again to free us from, the, from our sins by his blood. And now today we are a kingdom of we are prophet, a kingdom of prophets and priests, alright? So all this were done at first advent. And it is the verse 7 that tells us about the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And John says, look, he is coming with the clouds. And the use of the present tense is to show us that it is so sure. It is as if John can see visibly that Jesus is coming. All right? that it is actually happening. So today we are going to look into verse 7 to talk about the second advent of Jesus Christ. Because so much emphasis has been put on the first coming. Yes, it's very important. But today, let us cast our eyes on the second advent. And the first point that we see here is that He is coming. And it begins with the word look. But in the more traditional uh, versions, uh, they don't use the word look, they use the word behold. And when you hear the word behold, uh, it gives a, a, a weightier sense, all right? And it is a call to pay attention. Like if you go to class, the teacher say, hey, look. When people say look, you must pay attention, right? No, it's a call to attention. And this word look or behold, it appears 25 times in the book of Revelation. And we have to pay attention. Why? Because what John is going to say is very, very important. And it's, John says, he is coming with the clouds. Now, sometimes we think, oh, this is the rapture. Do you know what's the rapture? Now, if, if you are not familiar with Christianese, all right, Christian language, huh? rapture is the time when Jesus comes and the dead will rise and those who are living and have accepted him as the Lord, they will also rise up and meet Jesus. And it's record, it is uh, described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, where it says, The Lord will come down from heaven and then he will give a loud command. Okay? And with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call, ta 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 ta, or something like that, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are living, all of us, well, one day you come to church huh? and if Jesus comes, uh, all of us suddenly disappear, alright? We who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That means we will rise. So uh, don't worry, uh, if you have never flown before, when Jesus comes, all of us will fly up, okay? <laughs> we will rise together and meet Jesus in the clouds, in the air. That means the, when Jesus comes in the rapture, it is in the air. Jesus doesn't come down on earth. And it is in the clouds and it is not a physical coming of Jesus Christ. Then it says, when we look at uh, He is coming and that He is coming with the clouds, actually, uh, John is using, is describing something that has already been uh, described in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, Daniel had a vision as well. In Daniel's vision, which is in Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14, Daniel wrote, I was watching in the night visions. You know, God comes and visits us at night also, okay? And behold, see the word behold, look, look, pay attention. One like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, this person who has coming, who came down with the clouds, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. And this dominion that he is receiving is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom the one which will not be destroyed. So, it is an echo of what uh, Daniel saw. So, John is saying, hey, this son of man, this Jesus, uh, he's coming back. He is the son of man that you all have been waiting for, that you are expecting. And this son of man, when he comes, he's going to replace all these rebel kingdoms with God's kingdom. 
and it will be a kingdom that is everlasting. And all peoples, you know, now you don't want to serve him, never mind. But when that day comes, everyone will serve him. Because the Bible tells us, every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So this is an enthronement scene. And some people say that, oh, because it's enthronement, it is, you know, done in heaven now. Nah. It's not on earth. But if you read carefully Daniel 7, towards the end, it is done, it is an enthronement that is on earth. Jesus is coming to earth, alright? And Jesus himself uses Daniel 7 in Matthew 24, verses 30 to 31, to describe the events surrounding his second coming. And these events are earthly, they are public, they are visible, and they have universal effects. So, verse 7 is a description of Jesus coming. He is coming. Whether you believe or not, He's coming, right? And it will be manifested on earth. And the second point that we see from this verse is that every eye beholding, because it says every eye shall see Him. Now, when, when John wrote that, I think people will say, Ayah John, what nonsense are you talking about? If Jesus appear in Penang, will the people in Singapore be able to see him? Will the people in America be able to see him? You know, it, it, it boggles the mind when it was first written. But nowadays, anything that happens, uh, all of us can see how we see. Uh, your, your WhatsApp will come in, your Facebook will come in, everybody will see. So, it is something that is very possible. And the word every eye, is seldom used in the Bible, but Isaiah loves the word every eye. Okay, in Isaiah 40, verse 5, Isaiah says, The glory of Yahweh of God will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. Everyone, all of us. Isaiah 52, verse 8, For eye to eye they shall see the return of Yahweh to Zion. Isaiah 52, verse 10. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Isaiah 66 verse 18 The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall see my glory. So it is not a, a coming that is secretive. It is not a coming that is quiet and hidden. And that was um, what happened in the first coming. Even until the, his own people couldn't see that he's, he's already here. But here it is God coming in His glory, in His full authority, deity and sovereignty to judge the earth. But notice, uh, in the midst of all the everybody seeing, it, John includes even those who pierce Him. Who, who are these people who pierce Jesus? Now, if you uh, read the Gospel of John, you will find that the Roman soldier pierced Jesus on the side. Okay, But here it's talking about those. So who are these those? And again, to understand these those, you must look at the Old Testament. That's why uh, some people say, uh, we are New Testament believers. Old Testament doesn't matter already, you can forget about it. No, no. In order to fully understand the richness of the New Testament, we must refer to the Old Testament. And here this reference is to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, where uh, Zechariah writes, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So Zechariah 12.10 identifies those who pierce Jesus. They are the Jews. All right? They are instrumental in the death of Christ. And they will mourn. And when they recognize that they have murdered the righteous one and have crucified him who is Lord and Christ. So in one sense, it's not just the Jews. All of us 
because of our sin, we have crucified Jesus. So it will be all people's mourning. Now all men will recognize that it was their sin that sent Jesus to the cross. And it will not be that all of them will repent. Praise the Lord, we have repented, we have accepted Jesus and He is our Lord and Master. But not everybody will, will repent. And those who are unrepentant, they will be remorseful, they will mourn with dread because they have rejected the only one who could be their saviour. Now at his first coming, Jesus revealed through his humble state that God has come to suffer a cross for those he loved and even for his enemies. But at the second coming, God's presence will be revealed in his glorious state. God will come as a conquering king and as a righteous judge on all his enemies. And it will be a terrible, terrible day when Jesus comes again to destroy his enemies. That's why there will be all people's um, mourning. And finally, uh, John ends with Amen resounding. Amen resounding is a very strong affirmation. When we pray, what do we say at the end? After we have prayed, we all say, Amen. Amen is to say, yes, I agree with what you have prayed. It could be translated, let it be so. So when here you say, so shall it be, Amen, it is a very powerful statement of the certainty. Yes, yes, Jesus is coming again. A very sure certainty that the events surrounding it will happen. And we, even we are to the extent that we say, uh, it will certainly come to pass. Amen. Now, why am I telling you all that? It is not to just give you a, a head knowledge, all right? It is good that you know Jesus is coming again. It is good that you know that all these things are going to happen. But so what? Why not? In everything that we read in the Bible, you know, when it comes to application, we have to ask that question, so what? So Jesus is coming, so what? What does it matter to us? You know, the most quest important question is not if Jesus will come, because we know Jesus will definitely come, it's settled. And it is also not when he will come, huh? that's a very good uh, question and a very popular question. Everybody wants to know, during the pandemic, does that mean that Jesus is coming already? Which is why we have a lot of uh, Bible studies on Revelation and all that. Because when, let me tell you, if anybody says that Jesus is coming, I can guarantee you he's not coming. Because the Bible tells us nobody knows. All right. So if people say, ah, you know, uh, now with the pandemic, I think uh, Jesus is coming already. Then I can t safely tell you, Jesus is not coming because Jesus coming is unknowable. Okay. And the most helpful question we ask is, so what? So because the second coming is not an abstract doctrine, you know, something we learn in our Bible study, you come to church and then I tell you and then you, your ears get very tickled, oh, Jesus is coming. Huh? But it is an event that will shape your Christian life. Because knowledge of the second coming of Christ should generate an expectant hope. Now, Titus 2.13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Oh, Titus is saying, this is our blessed hope. What is the hope that we have? You know, we always pray for uh, peace, we always pray for joy, and we also mention that in hope. But our idea of hope is very vague. But here, you know, when Paul wrote to Titus, he's saying, the blessed hope, what is that hope? The hope is that Jesus is coming again. All right. When Jesus comes again, all your sorrows, all your tears will be gone and life will be very much more meaningful. And for most of um, Christian history, expecting the second coming was more than a hope for us now is that oh, when, we, when Jesus comes, uh, we are going to heaven. Wow, wonderful. Heaven is such a beautiful place. And then it's like uh, we, are, we, are, we are changing address, you know. We have bought a new house like that. Yes, Jesus said he's 
he's preparing many rooms for us and all that. But it is beyond that. Those people who, who were looking forward to Jesus' second coming in the first century, they were people facing war, they were people facing pestilence, maybe worse than the, the COVID-19, eh? because in those days they don't have vaccination and all that. So they were facing pestilence, they were yearning for deliverance from destruction, a yearning for deliverance from poverty. They were so poor and from a persecution and even a deliverance from martyrdom. So to them, uh, the second coming of Christ is very, very important. It is foremost in their thinking. But as Christians in the 21st century, we live a very comfortable life. We have aircon. Yeah, the doors are open now. Why? Because we need to ventilate the place. If not, cannot meet. All right. So we've got big ventilator fans there as well. So we are doing everything we can to make sure that uh, we are meeting safely. So for us, we are so comfortable that it diminishes our yearning for Jesus' return. Whether Jesus' return or not doesn't matter. What? Just enjoying life. Right? And it can lead to spiritual complacency. And for many of us, heaven is too distant. I have a long, long time to go. Lah. In fact, Jesus, you don't come in my lifetime. It's okay also. And eternity is too abstract. We can't even imagine tomorrow. What more eternity? Right? And Jesus' return has become very theoretical. It has no impact, practical impact on our life. So, we need to recapture this yearning for something so beautiful that is eternally satisfying that it will eclipse all the things around us. When we sing the song, when I gaze into your holiness, when I look into your gaze into what your beauty and all that, all things that surround me become shadows. You know, when, the, when seeing Jesus and having Him come becomes our focus, then you find that the things that are around us loses its hold upon us. So we are to live with an expectant hope. We are also to live a sanctified life. There is someone who says, if our longing is not right, our living will not be right either. If your longing is not right, your living will not be right either. That means what you desire, what you long for, will direct your living. Let's say a person, he, he only uh, longs for more money and more money and more money. You find that that will affect the way that he lives his life. He will always do whatever he can, rob, steal, cheat, to get more money. All right. So what you long for is very important and a healthy anticipation of Jesus' return will infuse your Christian life with a focus and an urgency that will lead to growth in holy living. Now why do I say this? Because 1 John chapter 3 verses 2 to 3 says, John says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, when Jesus comes again, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope, that means this hope to see Jesus, purifies Himself just as He is pure. So we should live when we have this hope to see Jesus, we will endeavour, we will try by God's grace with the help of the Holy Spirit to live pure lives. And I believe one of the obvious reasons why Jesus purposely did not reveal the time of His coming, you know why? So that we will live pure lives. Now, imagine if you know for sure Jesus is going to return on the 31st of December 2021. How will you live your life? Some people will say, wow, we better go and hurrah and uh, enjoy our life first. Uh, do everything. And then on the night of December 30 at 
59. Oh, we quickly repent. Lord, I come back to you. I acknowledge you are my God and Savior. Cleanse me of all my sin. And December 31st, ah, hallelujah, Jesus returns. That will be the attitude of most people. And I believe if I'm going to be truthful, it is my attitude as well. And that is why Jesus did not tell you when he is coming. So that you will live lives of purity, not knowing where he's coming. So you are always on your toes. You are always on your toes. Now, by the grace of God, we can live faithful and pure lives in all aspects of our Christian walk. And one famous preacher once said, he says, we have to live as if Christ died yesterday, rose from the grave today, and is coming back tomorrow. When we can live with that attitude that Christ died yesterday, he rose again today, and he's coming back tomorrow, I tell you, that is a very good motivation for us to live godly lives. And the next thing is to be a faithful servant. And in the parable of the talents, Jesus tells about a master who entrusts talents, which is gold, huh? gold, okay, money, all right, to his servants before he left for a journey. So to one he gave five talents, another one, two, and then the last one he gave one. So he, he left and then when he came back, he found that the first two servants who had five and two talents had invested their talents and they had reaped a, a, a profit, all right? And so the master was very happy with them. But when he went to this servant with one talent, the servant said, I didn't do anything with it. I, in fact, I hid it. And then the master was very upset stripped him of his talent, gave it to the first servant and cast him out into darkness. Now, this parable is to tell us that we need to invest in God's kingdom over building our own. Are all of us here, we have different uh, levels of ability. We are all uh, at different age. We are all having different amounts of resources, some of you richer, some not so rich. We have different types of family situations. Some are just young parents, some like us are grandmothers, grandparents already. And we have different emotional capacities. And the question is not about how, uh, how much God has given you. It is not a measure of how much God has given you. It is a, a, the question is how you are using what God has given you. And so, I think it is very timely when I prepared this, uh, that the announcement came for Help Wanted. So I urge all of you, in view of Jesus' second coming, if you have any talents, if you have the time, if you are desirous to serve God, then please call either the worship ministry, the multimedia ministry, or the children's church and serve. Invest in the kingdom of God. Because when you invest strategically in Jesus' kingdom, at the end of the day, when Jesus comes, you know the best uh, commendation that you can receive is, well done. Not uh, your, your steak, uh, well done. Uh, okay, This is well done. Good and faithful servant. And lastly, we are to be eager witnesses. An eager witness. Now, the more Christians contemplate Jesus' return, of course, when Jesus is coming, uh, it's good news, but it's also bad news for others, you know, because it's a time of judgment. When we know that Jesus is coming, then we have to be very eager, we have to be very enthusiastic, we have to be very determined and committed in our evangelistic witness. And this is rooted in the Gospel and also in the Great Commission. The lost urgently need to hear of Christ before they meet Him. And Peter reminds us, he says in 2 Peter uh, verses, chapter 3, verse 9, he says, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
So when we ask, Jesus, you say you are coming, you say you are coming, why are you not here yet? God is not slow in keeping his promise. But there is a reason why the second coming of Christ is delayed. It's because Jesus doesn't want anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. But how, how do these people come to repentance? It's when we go and tell them about the good news of Christ. So the Christian who confesses Jesus is coming, and if you stand on the word of God, it says that salvation is only found in the name of Jesus. Then, witnessing should be a part of our lifestyle. Because what we believe must affect the way that we live today. Okay, what we believe must result in the way we live today. So, finally, after hearing all this, you know, as we look back in those days when Jesus first came, there were people in the darkness waiting for the Messiah's first coming. And we, living in the in-between, we are looking forward to Jesus' second coming. And this season of Advent, let us not just celebrate, okay, yes, it's a great thing to celebrate the, the first coming of the Lord, that He came to save us. But it is an invitation also for us to prepare to prepare for the glory of his second coming. At the first coming, Jesus came as a humble lamb of God. He came as a baby. And like I've always told you, I always wondered, you know, Jesus, why didn't you come like the Terminator? Uh, boom, suddenly, you know, an adult person, uh, then you can accomplish so much. You came as a baby, a weak, fragile, defenseless baby. But let me tell you, when Jesus comes again at the second coming, he will not be a baby. He will be coming as a glorious king. From the Lamb of God, we now see the Lion of Judah, the Lion of Judah, and he's going to reign over all. So until he comes, may we find ourselves longing for the day when the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and King. And may we pray with all the saints of the age and have that Maranatha mindset. You know what's Maranatha? Maranatha means, Lord, come. May we have that mindset that says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Lord, you say that you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are also the one who is and who was and who is to come. You are the eternal God. You are also the Almighty and with you nothing is impossible. So Lord, we declare today that Lord, you will certainly and surely work out your divine purposes in human history. And because of that, we can be assured that you are returning, you are coming back. So help us, your church, your people, O oh God, to live with an expectant hope that we will always live with an awareness that you are coming, that we will be watchful and that we will pray. And that as we yearn for you, O oh God, this yearning will translate into a sanctified life that we will endeavor by your grace and your holy spirit live lives that are holy and blameless so that when you return O lord you will find your church a spotless bride a radiant bride and lord even as we are living in the in between lord you have given us work to do so, Lord, we want to give ourselves to be faithful servants of yours. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us, for all the abilities, the talents, the possessions, the opportunities that you have put in our hands. Help us to be good stewards of our time, our talent and our treasure. And Lord, because we have this great treasure, the gospel, the good news that Lord, you came, you died and you saved us. May we, O oh God, be eager witnesses. 
ready to preach the word in season and out of season. So Lord, we want to ask today, O oh God, that Maranatha, that Lord, you come. Father, bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, as we leave this place, Father, we also want to give unto your kingdom. We want to invest, O oh Lord, into your kingdom. And so we pray also for the offering, for the tithes, and for all the missions giving that are going to be dropped into the box. That Lord Jesus, you bless the giver. That as they invest in your kingdom, Lord, they will reap a rich reward. And so Father, we thank you and I want to release your blessing upon your people. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a very blessed week. And please remember, we are following SOP. So uh, even as you are dismissed, make sure you leave the hall in your rows. Okay? God bless you.